everybody, it's Christy Rangel, Communications Director at Broadmoor United Methodist Church, and I'm here with your announcements. You're invited to a special lecture given by Reverend Dr. Jamie Clark Souls on Saturday, October 2nd on her book, 1 Corinthians, Searching the Depths of God. This will be in the Casual Worship Center at 9 a.m. and you have to register to attend. So make sure that you go to our website, broadmoormethodist.org to register today. And I wanna make sure that you know, Reverend Dr. Jamie Clark Souls will also be preaching that Sunday, October 3rd, in the 11 o'clock service, we're gonna have a combined service in the sanctuary. Well, she will kind of wrap up our whole sermon series on 1 Corinthians. You don't wanna miss it. Now and again, we can find God in our life in extraordinary moments, but usually he shows up in the small, quiet moments of our ordinary life. Coming up on October 10th, we have a new sermon series starting called The Ordinary Ways of God. This series will focus on the book of Ruth, and we will look at how God is subtly at work in the lives of ordinary people, and through their lives, we discover how God uses the ordinary moments to accomplish extraordinary purposes. As part of our series and a church-wide study, every household in our congregation will receive a free copy of David H. Roseberry's book, The Ordinary Ways of God. You can pick up your family's copy in Connection Cafe next Sunday. If you have any questions about these announcements or would like to get signed up for our weekly emails, please stop by Connection Cafe on Sunday or go to our website anytime. Hope you have a great week. Hi, my name is David. This is my friend Stephen. We're here to tell you about an exciting event. It is going to be a tailgate barbecue cook-off and it is going to be amazing. The Red Stick Together Tailgate Cook-Off is going to be on Saturday, October 30th from 4 to 7 p.m. And we're looking for more people to show off their best tailgate recipes. Uh, my friend Stephen here is going to tell you a little bit more about it. Yeah, it is, David. It's really going to be exciting. We've got a lot of people participating, but we need more. We are, uh, categories are entree, we bring an entree, I'm doing a beef brisket, you're doing a pulled pork, and appetizer, side dish, and dessert. It's $30 per entry, and if you think that's a little bit high, get other people to participate. Share the cost. Uh, your Sunday school class, friends, neighbors, relatives, even if you don't like them. Uh, get everybody to participate because the bottom line, this is a great cause, and we're excited about it. And uh, you want to say a little more? Yeah, you? it's going to be an amazing thing that we're doing for a thing that we call Red Stick Together here. And uh, Red Stick has been around for well over a year now. We're providing foods for all kinds of people that are in need of food. We serve 250 plates every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, and we're well over 50,000 plates right now. All of the proceeds will go to help fund Red Stick Together. Even though we're on different teams, Texas A&M, LSU, we're still here together for a common cause. Working together. That's right. So come out and support us and uh, take time to think about being a part of this. And enjoy the best beef brisket that you'll have. Or pork. Or pork, that's true. And remember, it's only $30 for you to help raise money for our food ministry, Red Stick Together. And today is the last day to sign up. Please go to broadmoormethodist.org slash cookoff for rules and registration. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online contemporary service here at Broadmoor. We're so excited to be worshiping with you this morning. I just want you to sing these next couple songs with us. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. 
Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. When I lose my way, I forget my name, remind me who I am. In the mirror, all I see is who I don't want to be, remind me who I am. In the loneliest places, when I can't remember what grace. Tell me once again who I am to you, who I am to you. Tell me lest I forget who I am to you, that I belong to you, to
heart is like a stone And I'm running far from home Remind me who I am I can't perceive your love Afraid I'll never be enough Remind me who I am If I'm your beloved Can you help me Good morning, church family. Let's take a moment to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for being with us this Sunday morning in this beautiful weather that we've been enjoying this past uh, few days. And as we prepare our hearts for the message, God, we just once again look to the example of your son Jesus through everything he taught with his words and especially his actions, how love is the ultimate foundation, the ultimate building block for us as a church and for us to build a better world to live in. In your son's name we pray, amen.
Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Kinnan, and welcome again to our online contemporary worship experience. We're glad you've joined us. No matter where you are, we hope that you feel welcomed here, and we hope that you get something uh, out of the message today. I'm, uh, we're in a series right now called 1 Corinthians, Searching the Depths of God, and we are past the midway point now. Last week, we took a look at a beautiful chapter in 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. It's probably my favorite chapter out of the entire book and uh, we're gonna take a look at that same chapter again this week because we're gonna underscore it like I totally meant what I said last week so much that I'm gonna say some more things about it this week and so Amber and Eric are gonna help me unpack this by reading the word we're gonna take a look at the whole chapter so read along with us 1 Corinthians chapter 13 if I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul. I ask, Lord, that you would have your spirit use them to search us, God. Search us deeply, Lord. And reveal to us, Lord, your meanings, the message that you have uh, for each of us, Lord. Uh, and I just ask, God, that you would help it to transform who we are and how we are. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and by his power alone. Amen. Amen. So last week, I talked to you about how what Paul intended for this church in Corinth, which was a real messy church, <laughs> aren't they all? But in this one, it was extra messy. Um, how he intended to send the message that, hey, church, don't be a puffed up church. Be a church that builds up. And we talked about that in great detail. And really, the Apostle Paul, when it all boiled down to it, he identified love as the fix-all for all of the problems that that church was going through. Everything that they were facing as a congregation in Corinth, really, he identified love as the thing that was going to take them to where they wanted to go. And so uh, they did what we still sometimes find ourselves doing today, and they had been relying on their spiritual gifts to fix their issues, so that it was by their power, right, instead of God's power. But Paul said, hey, you can prophesy and, and you can speak eloquently all you want, but without love, you're a noisy gong. Then he, Paul talked about sacrifices. Paul said, hey, you can give until you bleed, but without love, you get nothing. He talked about status because that was also a big deal, especially at the communion table. The rich people and the people who had the most spiritual gifts were, were coming and taking the first bread and juice and communion and leaving the scraps for those who, felt, who they felt were inferior to them. And Paul said, you can, you can actually be the be-all and end-all all you want, but without love, you're a nobody. So this was very provocative. He even told them, hey, all you clever ones, all you people who know everything, you can know it all, but without love, 
you are nothing. These were big words. Paul was essentially saying, hey church, you have all the gifts that you need to extend the ministry and the mission of Jesus Christ on earth. But what you have to have for them to be spiritual gifts that God bestowed upon you is love. That's what makes them divine spiritual gifts. And you have them all. You lack none of them, but they were lacking love. Now, I want to talk about the Greek meaning of love, which is largely Paul's audience. That's certainly who he would have been writing to here. Um, and they had a much more flushed out way than we do uh, in talking about love. In fact, they had six distinct words that helped them to know what kind of love was being referred to when they were talking about it. And honestly, I'm a bit jealous because I think we overuse the word love in our culture and it sometimes makes it less meaningful and it sometimes makes it kind of confusing. Mm. So there was this first word, eros. And eros, this was a romantic, but not always in a good way, kind of love. The reason why it wouldn't be good is because it could also become an obsessive kind of love or a love that possessed someone, if you will. And so that's very ironic to me because here in the West, it's our dream to fall madly in love with someone, right? So there was also this word that they used for love called philia. And this was like a deep friendship. Uh, it was, think of like Band of Brothers, or did you ever see that movie, uh, uh, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, that kind of like sibling uh, bond, you know, uh, that forms sometimes, kind of like the, the, the bond that we share. Um, and so it, uh, it's always uh, uh, interesting, though, because there's a second one, kind of an offshoot of this one, uh, called Storge, and that one is um, the same kind of bond, but more like a parent-child. Uh, right? And so another one was pragma. Now this was a very long-standing, enduring kind of love. Uh, it involved compromise over a long period of time, which made the, the relationship very long. And um, it was not really a falling in love. It was more like a staying and standing in love. Then there was falacia. And this was a self-love that really had a two-sided coin. On one side was a very unhealthy, narcissistic kind of love, kind of self-love. But on the other side of the coin was more of a healthy uh, love that gave you the capacity to love even more. But every single instance in this chapter that was just read, Paul was referring to agape love. Agape love it's the universal love of all people. It's a word that would later be transferred into Latin as caritas, which is our English origin word for charity. C.S. Lewis would actually call this kind of love gift love. And I think that's brilliant. But of course, C.S. Lewis was a great theologian. Now, that's how the Corinthians would have unpacked love in Paul's time. But I have a question. How do you define love? How do you define love? That's a tough one. Um, you know, I think that right off the top of my head, I, I think about you know, the, the type of love that I've been shown from my parents, specifically. Um, I feel like that's the strongest form of love I've experienced in my life. <clears throat> One that I don't complete under, completely understand because I don't have children of my own. But um, the fact that they have always been behind me, always supported me, um, always been there for me even though they they showed kind of the tough love in a way as well throughout certain experiences that uh you know we went through as a family 
Um, you know, and, and then now, like, the way that our relationship has flourished today, it's just, um, it's, it's a, it's, it, it gives me a very cool perspective to, to, I try, I try to, to carry that into other aspects of my life, but it's, it's hard to describe, really, you know, it's, it's just, but I, I know that it's there, I have, I have confidence, and, like, I almost, like, rely on it, I feel mm-hmm. like, more than I even realize. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's good sharing. So what do you think? How yeah. do you define love? I think it's, like, <laughs> hard to explain, too, because there is, there's, like, romantic love and parent love and friend love, but I think for me, like, it's, like, good things. Like, like I might, I think I say, like, I love you too much, but it's because, like, I love you as a person. I love these things that you do. I love your heart. I love, like, all good things, Mm -hmm. you know. I love that you do this or do that or you treat people this way or... So, like, for me, I guess if I'm... It's, like, good things. Okay. Like... Awesome. You know. (laughs) You know, you're right, and I kind of agree with you. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's that um, deep affection of, like... I love my dog, Jagger. <laughs> you know, I really do. He greets me every time I come in the door, right? But then there's also kind of those pleasurable uh, interests, like I love tacos, right? I mean, I think everybody says that. So we use this word a lot, mm-hmm. but we use the same word to describe every kind of love, and that makes it kind of confusing, I think. Um, then there's kind of that really concentrated enjoyment that some of you like to sew, right? I love to sew. That might be something that uh, several of our uh, people around here uh, would say. And then there is that romantic love. I love my wife. You know, that's, that is another uh, kind of and level of love. In every instance, though, in this chapter, Paul spoke again and again and again of agape, the universal love of others. So what we must understand as Paul is writing to this church He's vetting love in the church in Corinth by asking, does your love help others? Does your love help others? Where's the charity? Where's the generosity in your love? But here's the rub. The Corinthians gave the love affiliated with charity, agape love, a bad name. In fact, if I had to assign this a soundtrack, it would be shot through the heart (laughs) and you're to blame. You give love a bad name. That's right. Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi is the one who captured the issue that Paul had identified in Corinth perfectly with these lyrics. An angel's smile is what you sell. You promise me heaven, then you put me through hell. And that's very, very, very hard to hear. But you know what? In what ways are we doing today as the Corinthians did then. And I think the first thing that we have to talk about is that word charity. We've made charity a bad word. That's unfortunate. Think about how we use it. If I need something that you have, I'm a charity case. The attitude, it immediately raises this negative response of what's it gonna cost me, right? It's the first thing people think, what's it going to cost me? And so as a pastor who is leading a flock, according to the teacher of Jesus Christ, is that really my job to talk you out of or to beg you for your money? Well, friend, if that's what needs to happen for you to respond to God obediently and faithfully, you're coming to the wrong church and you're hooked up with the wrong pastor. So I had, believe it or not, a congregant actually cut me off in the middle of me laying out a vision for a ministry plan that I had. And he said to me, let's cut to the chase. How much do you want us to write the checks for, pastor? You can't really make this stuff up. It was an egotistical, puffed-up response. 
and all it proved was that they could write a check. If they could have just written it with love, it would have made that an offering to God. I'd have felt a whole lot better about that. So not only have we made charity, caritas, generosity, agape love, gift love, a bad word, but our capacity to empathize with others, especially strangers, is dwindling right before our eyes. Look no further than our own border. Studies have shown that our empathy, that's our ability to share the feelings of other people, it has sharply declined over the last 40 years with the biggest and the steepest decline in the last decade. And that's at an alarming rate. That means that we are actually, as a world, losing the spiritual gift of the generous agape love that Paul was referring to. The underbelly of that fact is a puffed up, loveless culture hell-bent on making it about me or us and not about they or them. Paul's vetting of love in the church in Corinth asked, does your love help others? Where's the charity? Where's the caritas? Where is the agape gift love? Friends, charity, it's what we make of it. Charity is supposed to be about our generosity, not someone else's status. <laughs> we must get clear on our definition of agape, caritas love. It is not the insignificant love like I love tacos. It is not the romantic love like I love my wife. If we look at charitable love as status, I'm better than you because I have and you have not. Well, that is loveless. And that is exactly Paul's point. If we look at charitable love as you're just trying to get my money, you need me more than I need you. Well, that's loveless. That is about your generosity. No. No. It's about your ego. And so that's the problem, which was exactly what, what Paul was referring to, puffed up, right? Charity, agape, gift love, is supposed to be about the generosity that God calls us to, which is born out of the empathetic, shared love and concern that we have for all other people. It is supposed to be a spiritual gift, divinely bestowed, used to build up, not puff up. That is the real love that Paul was calling his church to, and it is the real love that I am calling this church to as well. Anything you have or do or know means nothing, gains nothing, or makes you significant in this world unless you have love. That's what Paul was after with the Corinthians, and that's what we need to take from the hearing of this word. Out of a generous and grateful heart, responding to God who was generous and charitable and empathetic with us in the person of Jesus Christ. We can move from being a noisy gong in this world to being a voice of truth and hope for an entire generation. We were made for such a time as this that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And with a message like that, you can burn revival across this land. But being a snooty, discouraging know-it-all to Instead of being a standard bearer that endures all things with the hope of Christ burning brightly in our world, 
Those are big differences, and you have that decision to make. It was in Jesus that God shared our feelings. Not looking down God's nose at us because God felt sorry for us, but with great empathy and a heart full of agape love, doing anything, including laying down God's own life for us. This love gift was patient in the face of those who repeatedly rejected him. This love gift was kind in the face of those who plotted to murder and crucify him. This love gift was not envious of power. It did not boast. He did not boast of his own power. Instead, he was humble all the way to death on a cross. The love gift of Jesus Christ was not full of himself. Rather, he emptied himself, poured out in a sacrifice like none has ever been known for the salvation of all people, agape love. The murderous plotters, they ceased. They ceased to exist. The kingdoms they ruled, they all faded. But Christ's love never failed. It never gave up. Because of him, now we have an eternal hope and an eternal confidence. It's about his generosity, not about our status. If it had been about that, trust me, we would have corrupted it like we always do. Church, your gifts become spiritual gifts the minute you add the agape love of Christ to them. And then you begin to be an effective actor in the building of God's kingdom. Love will unite us in mission. Love is the solution to the core of every single problem that we face in our church and in our culture and in our world. Imagine a church on the corner of Sharp and Molly Lee, or here in this studio broadcasting to you and your home, that demonstrates the extravagant love of God and meets all people where they are and shows them a love like they've never known but have always wanted. That's a church with transforming healing power. That's a church who knows how to mend the broken hearts of our people. That's a church that is relevant right now. Don't be the I Love Tacos church. <laughs> because who cares? Don't be the, I love my dog, church. That's not going to help it when somebody's loved one is dying of COVID over a Zoom call. And don't be the, I love to sew, church. It's all good. It sounds entertaining. But a dying, hurting world isn't looking for another activity. It is looking for a savior who can save them. <laughs> You want everyone in this, in this room to agree on one ruler, one leader? Why don't we agree on Jesus Christ? Why don't we agree and choose his love? Why don't we agree to extend his love? That's when every knee will bow. That is when every tongue will confess. And that, my friends, is a church that matters. Be that church. Be the love church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
even when my strength is lost and I'll praise you even when I have no song and I'll praise you even when it's hard to find no words the fire seems lost I'll praise you even when it hurts like hell and I'll praise you even when it makes no sense to sing love in the sing your praise and I will only sing My soul waits only for you, and I will sing till the morning has come. And all my heart burns only for you, and you are all, and you are all I want. And my soul. time on earth is done love and I sing your praise I will only sing your There are many ways that you can give toward the mission of Broadmoor. You can go to broadmoormethodist.org slash giving to give safely and securely online. You can text BE MORE to 73256. And of course, you can also mail checks to our physical address at 10230 Molly Lee Drive, Baton Rouge, Louisiana 70815.